<laughs> Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. When Wild Kingdom debuted in the early 1960s, handling and training animals to perform were common in many zoos. But today, animals like this capuchin monkey serve as wildlife ambassadors for their species in order to educate rather than just entertain. These ambassadors have been hurt in the wild and would not survive without human interaction. Trained professionals bottle feed them and foster the animals back to health. Then the animals become imprinted on their human caregivers. Wild Kingdom showed generations of people the majesty of our animal ambassadors and helped us to care about them. When you care about something, you become committed to saving it. And that's how we all succeed in the Wild Kingdom. So we're gonna sit back, relax, and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha. Hello. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. This is little Pierre, three and a half year old juvenile star of the chimpanzee show at the St. Louis Zoo. He's going to help me tell our story today. There are many stories in the Wild Kingdom, stories of primitive people, adventures in faraway places, and of course, exciting stories of the wonderful animals that occupy this earth with us. But of all the stories, the most fascinating to me are those that explore the unusual, the strange, the unknown. We call it the Mysteries of the Wild. As Jim and I have traveled into the far corners of the Wild Kingdom, we've had the opportunity to explore the known and the unknown. Yes, and there are many unknown things, even about little Pierre. For example, many primates have tails, but a chimpanzee has no tail at all. Not having a tail is not nearly as mysterious as having a detachable tail. Come with me to the desert of our great southwest and I'll show you what I mean. Our unusual animal mostly hides beneath rocks during the day and only comes out to feed at night when the temperature in the desert drops. He's the banded gecko, an agile little lizard who doesn't bite and is quite harmless. He has no real defense against his enemies, except for this one trick. When a hungry foe grabs him, like this, he simply detaches his tail and runs away. There's a small crack in his tail vertebrae where bone and muscle can break off neatly. The tail now seems to take on a life of its own. Its agitated movements further confuse his enemy, who doesn't know whether to go for the tail or chase after the gecko. By the time his enemy realizes he's been left with the tail end of the meal, the little gecko has long since gone into safe hiding. He'll simply grow a new tail. The gecko uses his detachable tail to escape from animals that prey on him. Devices used by some animals to capture their prey are even more fascinating, such as this trapdoor spider. He covers his burrow with a hinged trap door of spider silk and mud. He feeds on small bugs and other insects and builds his burrow near where they're plentiful. When he sees one approaching, he scuttles into his dark lair and prepares to attack his unsuspecting prey. Mm -hmm. 
the mystery here is how does the trapdoor spider know the bug is at the edge of his lair? Our cameraman has shown us how it is done. The answer really is simple. He just raises the trap door and peeks out. The lid fits so well that when it's closed, it looks just like the rest of the surrounding area to the approaching victim. In addition to peeking out of his trap door, the spider also waits below until he feels the vibration of the bug's footsteps. With his unique trap, this spider is one of the Wild Kingdom's craftiest predators. Many times, an animal exhibits a mysterious behavior for no apparent reason. <laughs> When we place the water near little Pierre, <laughs> it's pretty obvious that he doesn't want to go in it. But there's several animals that have a mysterious fascination for water. I first observed this in a Louisiana swamp. A red wolf, one of the rarest animals in the bayou, comes straight toward me. Fortunately, I've seen him first, and he doesn't catch my scent. Red wolves are shy animals who stay hidden in the daytime. But it's so hot and humid today that apparently he's come down to quench his thirst. But it looks as if he's got something else in mind. What a great way to cool off. Bobcats don't usually go after small frogs. But when they're really hungry, they'll tackle just about anything. The frog heads for the water and triggers one of the strangest reactions I've ever seen. She doesn't know it, but the frog has escaped and she's chasing her own splashes. Whereas most cats hate water, bobcats don't mind it, except when they miss their prey. To really explore the mysteries of the wild, it is necessary to travel to many remote areas of the globe. Our next stop is Midway Island to observe the courtship antics of the goonie birds. No one knows why these lazen albatrosses or goonie birds perform their courtship dance in this weird way. It's so comic, early day sailors called them goonie a slang word meaning simpleton. Other goonies, like these black-footed albatrosses, also go through an intricate ritual. Their courtship is one of the strangest sights in all of the wild kingdom. Another mysterious courtship dance is performed in distant Australia. The rainforest of the southeastern area is the home of the strangest bird in the world. It's a wonderful mimic. When you think you're hearing parrots, or a kookaburra, you're probably listening to the lyre bird. And there he is, the magnificent lyre bird in full plumage. This is a rare sight, 
and one I want to be sure not to miss. It's courting season, and the bird is clearing a circular stage for himself on the forest floor. On it, he will serenade his lady with song and dance. To the rhythm of his own melody, he prances and bows. The female watches as he reaches the high point of his dance. He extends the curved feathers that look like a Greek harp or lyre from which he gets his name. The lacy tail forms a fairy parasol. This breathtaking plumage takes eight years to develop. This unusual creature, whose habits are still a mystery to scientists, is one of the most magnificent birds in the wild kingdom. Right you are, Pierre. Our next stop is India, to see why a ferret can kill a deadly cobra. Part of the answer is in the pattern of the strike. Forward and down, and not very fast. This is one reason a ferret can kill a cobra, Let's see what the other reason is. The ferret is a bright, inquisitive animal, not easily frightened. He won't usually attack a snake as large as a cobra, but if he's hungry and sees one, look out. Spreading his hood, the cobra prepares to meet the challenger. He misses. This is the other half of the answer to our mystery. The speed of the ferret. His reflexes are so quick he can dodge the striking cobra sink his teeth into his spine, and paralyze his enemy. The ferret's speed is too much for the slow-striking cobra. One of nature's slowest animals lives in South America. The manatee, an air-breathing mammal that inhabits the rivers where water plants are his only food. In British Guiana, it's my assignment to capture a manatee in this canal and release it in another one that's clogged with vegetation. These are nature's original vacuum cleaners, and they do a good job of keeping the waterways open for transportation. This project is conducted in cooperation with zoologists from the British Guiana Museum. We hope to trap the manatee in a specially reinforced pocket in the back of our purse net. The question is, will it hold? Having secured the net as best we can, Project Supervisor Ram Singh and I head upstream. The problem is to get behind the manatees and drive them into our net. Manatees are lethargic and are not afraid of the movement of a boat. So they will move away from the commotion we make by thrashing the water with sticks. Slowly, these mysterious, almost prehistoric creatures move toward the net.
people for the net, and all escape except one. He's no lightweight, and it takes a lot of work to get him onto the bank. Once there, he doesn't put up much of a struggle because he's completely helpless out of the water. We're all anxious to examine this strange looking creature. He should weigh about 500 pounds and is at least eight feet long from his head to the tip of his odd paddle-like tail. His upper lip is divided into two parts. Each half works almost like a hand to pull weeds and water grasses into his mouth. As far as I'm concerned, the manatee certainly won't win any beauty prizes. Although he can breathe quite well on land, he's obviously much happier in the water. Equally as strange as his looks is the way he uses his front flippers. On land, they almost become legs. It took off. Of all the animal mysteries that have fascinated me over the years, the most amazing is the story of the grunion. It's almost unbelievable. And it happens on the coast of California only during the times of the full and new moon. The beach is transformed into a sheet of shimmering silver as thousands of the grunion twist and turn in the moonlight. They have not been washed up on the beach. They are actually spawning on the sand. The only fish in the world that come out of the water to lay their eggs on land. This fascinating sight can only be seen in one part of the world, along the Pacific coast from Central California, south into Baja California in Mexico. And only on three or four nights following the new moon and the full moon. And then only for two or three hours after high tide. On the right night at the right time, the female grunion swims onto the beach accompanied by one or more males. Wriggling her tail back and forth, she literally drills herself into the soft sand. There, two or three inches below the surface, she deposits her eggs. The males do not dig in, but lie next to her and deposit a milky white fluid called milt. This milt flows down the female's body to fertilize the eggs below the surface. One large female grunion can lay as many as 18,000 eggs in one season, lasting from late February until September. After the eggs have been fertilized, the weary female frees herself and with the males, returns to the sea with the next wave. She must time the whole operation with the utmost precision. If she takes too long, the tide will recede and leave her stranded on the beach to die. Grunion are collected by marine biology students so that we can examine this process of spawning and fertilization in greater detail. The living female is gently squeezed to remove the eggs. They're a clear bright orange, about the size of a pinhead. When the milt of the male is added, fertilization occurs and development of the embryo begins immediately. Using a special microscope and camera in a laboratory, we can examine the embryo. 
After nine days, the embryo looks like a ball with two big eyes and is ready to hatch. Already it possesses the germ of that mysterious wisdom which will one day enable it to perfectly time its spawning with the movement of the tides. The hatching is as fascinating as the spawning. When eggs are placed in seawater and stirred vigorously, they start hatching. Here they are after five minutes. The empty membranes float like balloons among the baby fish. Here's a closer look. Watch the egg at the arrow tip. The hatching is just as definitely connected with the movement of the tide as is the spawning. To understand it, we should remember there are low tides and high tides. A chart of the tides looks like this. The highest tides occur on the nights of the full moon and the new moon. Grunions spawn on the second, third, and fourth nights following the highest tides. The orange-colored eggs lie in a cluster in the cool, damp sand. Receding tides deposit more sand until they're buried deep, but they will only hatch when agitated in seawater. After nine days, the rising tides wash away the sand and hatch the eggs in the tumbling action of the surf. If the grunion were to spawn on a night before the highest tide, the next night's tide would wash away the eggs. If the grunion were to spawn too long after the highest tides, on, say, the sixth night, the rising tide four nights later would also wash away the eggs before they were ready to hatch. So the female grunion must choose the right night and the right hour of that night. Only during that magic hour can the eggs be laid where they will develop safely and the female escape to sea. This is one of the greatest of all our mysteries. How does the grunion know exactly when to lay her eggs? No one knows, yet the fish can judge time and tide with an uncanny accuracy no mariner possesses and reproduce their young in this strange and fascinating way. Well, it still remains a mystery why some primates have tails, while others, like little Pierre, go without. But this is just a minor mystery in the wild kingdom. In spite of man's recent progress in scientific research and knowledge, there are countless major mysteries still confronting us. The mystery of migration, of hibernation, of animal communication. And now almost every day we're facing new mysteries from outer space. These are exciting times. With each new bit of knowledge, mysteries are slowly unraveling. But many times, each new fact reveals an even more fascinating mystery. And this is why I believe there will always be a challenge to explore the unknown in the Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Like what you saw?
Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com. Mutual of Omaha. Protect your kingdom.